good afternoon everyone and a very warm welcome to those who have joined us today uh, uh, in in this another inaugurating webinar uh, jitender singh and i welcome you all all on behalf of ci leader and the nine dot nine group it's my pleasure to introduce today's ci gurukul session titled unlocking the secrets of data transformation uh, i'll be moderating this insightful session and uh, to set the context let's begin with uh, with our topic today in today's dynamic business landscape maintaining a sustained competitive edge is more challenging than ever with the rapid advancement of ai uh, ai driven tools analytics automation and robotics the journey toward data transformation for enterprises has become a cornerstone for most of the uh, successful stories however it's worth noting that not the picture is not so rosy uh, according to a 2021 mckinsey study about 69% of data transformation initiatives do not achieve their desired outcomes that's that's massive a lot of money get uh, uh, a lot of money uh, is being spent on processes technologies but the the outcomes are not up to expectations this is a, this is a very concerning issue for most of the technology leaders and cios uh of course uh, data transformation as we know it's 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 more than just technology implementation in today's uh, session we will explore strategies that empower businesses and cios to thrive amidst data transformation data disruption and it's also important to remember that transformation transcends the mere adoption of new data tools it involves a holistic reshaping of our approach to business embedding technology into every aspect of our operations people and products uh, well we are privileged to have tony saldana with us today uh, tony is a renowned author speaker and thought leader in global business services and it his 27 year tenure at fox and gamble coupled with his current role uh, as president of transform and places him at the forefront of data transformation expertise Tony has been instrumental in guiding over 20 Fortune 100 companies worldwide in their uh, data transformation journeys. Notably, he also led the seamless IT integration of the 10 billion Gillette acquisition, uh, US dollar 10 billion G uh, Gillette acquisition into Procter and Gamble, uh, completing the colossal task in less than 18 months and significantly in a very optimized uh, optimized budget. Tony's international business experience spans over three decades across the U.S., Europe, and Asia. He provides strategic data transformation advice to approximately 20 Fortune 100 companies, like I just mentioned. His authorship also includes influential books like Why Data Transformation Failed and Revolutionizing Business Operations. In our session today, Tony will share his invaluable insights on how to maximize value from data transformation. His discussion will cover the crucial role of technologies such as analytics, AI, and the business imperatives for embracing AI, and the key strategies for successful uh, implementation of newest technologies. We look forward to an engaging and enlightening session. Well, before we transition to Mr. Tony's insight, I encourage all delegates and participants to, to post their queries in the Q&A box for discussion at the end of the session. Thank you very much for joining us, Tony. And uh, we are privileged to have you. Oh, thank you for having me, Jitendra. My pleasure. Thank you. Well, uh, Tony, let me start with a very pertinent question that most of the technology leaders have today. Uh, uh, data transformation is certainly, uh, you know, it's 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 a topmost priority for uh, businesses today, uh, from customer experience, from interactions uh, with them. to automate the processes for better roi everything revolves around the newest technologies and how to how to how to create maximum impact on a customer journey however cultivating a holistic mindset toward data transformation uh, it goes beyond the adoption of new tools and instead embedding technology seamlessly into every aspect of operation people and products demand a very careful and meticulous planning could you please share your insights that what exactly uh, what is it i mean how do how do successful companies who have successfully implemented data transformation initiative and how some of the companies who who are who are, who are unable to reap the benefits in a similar way what are the key distinguishing factors and what according to you should be the priority uh, for companies today oh that's a fabulous question uh just in there um you very rightly pointed out that digital transformation 
you know, transcends technology. It is more than technology. And, and that is correct. Um, you also, uh, your statistic um, on uh, 69 to 70% of all digital transformations fail to meet their objectives um, is, 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 is also, I, I think, very pertinent. The challenge that we have when it comes to digital transformation in companies is that while most CIOs, CEOs, boards of directors understand that it is more the technology, you know, it is people, processes, and technology, the challenge that they have is more about change management. Um, so how do you go about changing your work process, your business model? Um, it's easy to change technology. It is much harder to change people habits. And so when it comes to digital transformation, you know, there are a couple of things that become really important. The most, the first and the most important piece for any CIO or CEO to understand is that they have to be exquisitely clear about what is the goal of the transformation. You know, implementing a new system is not a business goal. Um, you know, driving 10% additional sales by changing your you know, CRM processes, that is a clear business-oriented goal. Um, so that's point number one. The second point when it comes to digital transformation is that therefore, if digital transformation is more about change management, then applying the traditional PMI approved project management um, uh, processes alone is not sufficient. You have to apply a combination of HR organizational change management techniques, plus of course, project management. And so those are the couple of things that I think most business leaders get wrong. Yeah, Tony, you rightly pointed out change management aspect and of course, uh, uh, you know, the couple of insights that you have shared. But how do your organization effectively demonstrate return on investment for data transformation projects, especially when dealing with uh, intangible outcomes such as improved agility or enhanced customer experiences? Are there any specific success stories probably or best practices that you could highlight? There are. Um, so um, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about how to go about doing that, and I will then give you a few examples. Um, so, um, you know, it, it kind of goes back to the two points that I made around what's important. One is goal setting, and then the second is, uh, you know, the processes, the methodology that we use. Um, so on goal setting, at the end of the day, for business leaders, everything needs to go down to measuring success criteria the same way that the Lall Street or Wall Street would measure it, which is shareholder return, total shareholder return. Um, and so, um, you know, if I may, shareholder value is measured by three elements. One is top line growth, right? It's revenue growth. The second is profit. And the third is asset efficiency. Um, so when businesses want to um, measure things like agility, they have to do a much better job of translating those intangible goals like customer satisfaction or, you know, um, things like that, business agility down into the outcomes. Because yes, of course, you can still measure customer satisfaction and business agility. But if they in turn are only in process and don't get to the final outcome, uh, that's a problem. So that's tip number one that I would, uh, you know, uh, share uh, with, with our audience here. Um, and then case studies. There are tons of case studies. You know, you mentioned um, my own experience uh, in, in, in um, the Gillette company acquisition. So the story there is that in uh, 2003, uh, Procter & Gamble acquired Gillette. Um, and um, the Gillette company at that time was $10 billion. So in terms of Wall Street goals, what P&G did was P&G said, hey, look, we are going to absorb the internal operations of this entire $10 billion company, all of IT, all of finance, you know, all of the shared services. 
And the new combined Procter & Gamble will still have the headcount and the total spend flat, okay? And we will do that. And, 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 and that will result in a you know, $1.2 billion synergy. So very specific goals uh, related to profitability of the company, right? Um, and so once you do that, then you know, your, your, your success criteria is extremely clear, which is that you know, you know exactly what the end state is. You know, you know you have 18 months to do that. You know what your scope is. Um, whenever you have organization challenges, like for example, in the midst of that transition, one of the Gillette businesses, uh, uh, Brown raises, you know, Brown raises. They said, "Hey, you know, we cannot cut over during Christmas season because that's our biggest sales period." Well, we took it up to the Procter and Gamble CEO and the Gillette CEO and said, "Hey, this is your choice. You know, this is the Wall Street uh, commitment." Um, if you want to go back and change it, you know, we can always change it, of course, you know, they would not change it. And so, so this is really how you, the, the art of dealing with change management, when the outcome is extremely clear. Yeah, you said outcome is extremely clear, is extremely critical for uh, any, any kind of transformation initiative. In fact, I would briefly like to touch upon uh, one of the book which you have also authored, uh, you know, uh, why the digital transformation projects fail. <laughs> so could you, I mean, based on your research, uh, would you be able to throw some uh, valid insights or maybe key, key bullet points or in, in a very concise and summarized way that why do digital transformation fail? Um you know, um, this is this this was a, a very interesting uh, research for me. Um, I had ended up uh, speaking with about a hundred different CEOs, um, consultants, you know, startups, and things like that. Um, and uh, Jatinder, you won't believe um, the the um, the number one issue that I ran into is that uh, most people, senior people, that talk about digital transformation. Um, they were unclear of what the meaning of the term digital was, right? Mm -hmm. Or digital transformation was. Um, so, um, you know, there were, of course, one set of people that said, hey, you know, this is, yes, of course, this is the digital era, but the technology companies just hype it. My CIOs just hype it. You know, for God's sake, we used to have digital technologies even in the 1970s, we had digital watches, you know, so on and so forth. So this was one end of the spectrum. And of course, the other end of the spectrum were people that were like, oh no, this is AI and robots that are coming for us and stuff like that. So, you know, for the CIO community, one of the things that I would um, like to share is that, look, it is our job to be clear in communicating what we mean by digital transformation, right? Um, the reality is that, you know, there are many different interpretations even within your own organization of what digital transformation is, but it is much more urgent for you and your company to transform than you think. The way I explain this is I say, you have to you know, put this in the context of the fourth industrial revolution. Unlike the first three industrial revolutions that were driven by steam engines and electricity and the internet, the fourth one, digital, is going to change every other technology, mechanical, you know, social, medical, so on and so forth. So this means that digital transformation is the conversion of companies that used to be successful in the third industrial era into the fourth industrial era. So please do not communicate relatively small technology changes as digital transformation. If you are implementing you know, the next version of SAP or Workday or whatever it is, please do not call that digital transformation. Um, it is automation. Right. Yeah. And so this is the first thing, you know, that that I do, which is I put this in the context of 
a five stage maturity of digital transformation. And then you have to say, no, I'm just going to go with, you know, stage one to stage two. And that way, there is no confusion. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you briefly touched upon change management. In my interaction with most of the uh, CIOs, uh, that basically one of the topmost priority for them as we move to 2024, mm -hmm. whether it's it's about moving to uh, moving to Gen AI or to automation, RPA, we have seen some successes earlier, but then uh, for a lot of companies, uh, you know, those, I mean, they also have to uh, witness some massive failures on their RPA projects. So change management is one of the key uh, priority area as far as strategic uh, implementations are concerned. So how can, uh, you know, in, in your view, what are the core ingredients of a successful chain management strategy for CIOs? So when it comes to change management, I think what um, CIOs need to understand is that uh, in today's world, um, when we do technology projects, mm -hmm. um, we plan for technical architecture, we plan for implementation, we plan for adoption. And then, you know, somewhere towards the end, we bring in HR to help us with, you know, organization change management, right? The approach there is that we are pushing change. Um, the, the, the thing that needs to happen is that you actually need to start with planning for organizational process and people change management first and then technology change management later. So you have to flip the whole paradigm. You have to ask yourself, you know, how am I going to communicate to this massive group of people who may be afraid of, you know, um, uh, you know uh, AI or, you know, what's going to happen to their jobs and stuff like that. And you have to start with that and then work backwards to figure out what is in it for them, right? How are you going to communicate to a person who's afraid that, hey, if I implement this technology, my job as the payroll manager goes away. And so once you do that, you know, you end up with a very different roadmap and different paths of resistance within the organization. Could you also share some of the examples based on, I mean, you, you have managed so many transformation initiatives. Would you be able to share some uh, best practices based on the real real life examples, specifically on chain management? Absolutely. Um, so one of the examples that uh, I would like to share um, goes back to um, when I was the CIO and the Shed Service leader uh, of Procter & Gamble in Central Eastern Europe, Middle East, and Africa. So this was like 100 countries. Um, and um, one of the big changes, um, and, and, and you know, as you know from the, the regions that I just talked about, these are countries that are developing countries for the most part, right? Um, so one of the big things that um, I wanted to drive was the visibility of sales. Um, you know, down the distributor and then sub-distributor all the way to the retailer, right? This was a big challenge, not just for Procter & Gamble, but every other country that's a multinational, because how do you get real-time information on, you know, the small little retailer in, you know, let's say Ghana, who is selling, you know, your products out of a houseboat, right? Um, and how do you roll all of that information up? Right? Um, this was a big deal because, you know, um, the, the, the reality is that automating this was not just automating within PNG, it is also automating the distributor and the sub-distributor and the stockist and, 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 right? Um, very, very complicated, as you can imagine, Jatin, right? So um, again, the approach there was first and foremost to get exquisitely clear about what the goal is. And if the goal was transparency to quote unquote real time, which we we explained that as daily, so not real, real time, but daily, right? Uh, Offtake distribution, inventory, so on and so forth, down the entire chain, right? Um, what we did was first and foremost, you know, always start with a relatively small scope. So we said, it's just these six measures. 
it's off take distribution, you know, so on and so forth, right? And this is how we define it. And we have to standardize that definition across half of the world, right? Within Procter & Gamble. Um, the second thing is identify the key stakeholders, you know, what's in it for the small little retailer on the board? What's in it for the big distributor in Saudi Arabia? What's in it for the Procter & Gamble? So you create those, you know, uh, the, 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 those kind of um, people uh, form us. And then you start to then have a story of what life is going to be like. How is it going to be better as a result of this? And only then we kind of got into the implementation. Within um, about two years, Jatinder, um, as a result of this, we had better visibility to store data in that exotic CNN part of the world than we did in the US, right? And so it is possible, but we have to do it the right way. Yeah, you have to do it right way. With, uh, with so much data being generated, there is also one, uh, uh, you know, while data is, of course, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, the, it's the new goal, but it's also creates a lot of problems for uh, especially younger companies, which data to uh, keep and which data to which data to retain and which data they can just do away with. So that's another uh, another another big challenge. A lot of senior IT executives uh, face dilemma. So could you share your thoughts uh, on that problem? Indeed, um, it is a challenge. You know, it's that balance between. Um, you know, do you store the data with the hope that you might use it later on? Yeah. Or, you know, do you essentially have a, an, an, an end goal in mind to use it, right? So um, the advice I would give uh, young organizations and young CIOs is, you know, first and foremost, um, as much as possible, start with what I call uh, the the Rubik's cube um, of you know what are the various use cases of data? What are the types of data that are possible? Right? Uh, in most organizations, that's very clear. I mean, that's customer data, it's sales data, it's financial data, you know, so on and so forth. Right? Um, uh, secondly, what you have to do is you have to have a really good idea about which are the use cases which are higher potential than others, right? Uh, not every use case is the same. I mean, yes, it would be great to have employee data for all of the things that your employees do in the company. But reality is that, you know, unless you're in a people business, for most other companies, you know, your sales and your revenue data is probably more value than trying to track every movement of your employees, right? So be very clear in that Rubik's cube on, you know, which of the elements are potentially more valuable than others, right? The third thing that you do is then, you know, you start to work on use cases. The mistake that most technologists do is that they start to work on the belief of build it and they will come, which is let's get, you know, our data lake, you know, Let's get our data fabric together. You know, let's get our AI platform together. And then I'll figure out what to do with it. Um, that's a mistake, right? You have to build use cases and data collection in parallel. Um, the mistake that people make is they say, well, I cannot do AI because I need a lot of data to train the algorithms. No, that's absolutely not correct. You know, you can start to work in parallel. And so once you do that, you get better and better at figuring out, you know, just how much data is truly valuable, how much is potentially valuable, you know, 10 years down the line. And you can deprioritize that based on actual, you know, net present value, NPV, ROI type of stuff. So that's the way I would approach it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> I think it's it's like you said, it's it's critical that what what is your end objective and also the the process methods have to define right at the beginning and then you can measure the quality payable results. Uh, uh, with respect to that, with uh, right now we are witnessing a massive uh, interest toward uh, uh, AI driven applications, and 
uh, especially the generative AI aspect, which uh, a lot of companies are trying to build use cases. But it is also true that uh, most of the organizations and their CIOs are facing issues like cybersecurity issues, hallucination of uh, AI, and there are other 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 related aspects which are basically uh, hindering the uh, uh, their uh, you know implementations or delaying delaying their projects. Uh, would you would you be able to share your insights that how how to how to deploy effective AI and automation uh, driven operations uh, and uh, probably if you could share some of the successful use cases that you may have observed in the U.S. market and Europe that would be of great interest to CIOs. Um, so let me let me deal with this issue of um, cyber security first um, and then. Um, uh, we can get into some of the use cases of AI. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the thing that the reality is that, um, you know, for CIOs, if they have um, infrastructure that is porous, if that is not secure, then I wouldn't even try putting on a use case for uh, AI. Um, so I, I would, you know, that's the reason I want to deal with cybersecurity first, which is to say, look, it is your job as the CIO um, to be very blunt in making sure that you do affordable cybersecurity. And that is the price of entry for you to be in that role. Right? Yeah. Um, if all you are doing is spending all of your time trying to make a big you know, proposal of, I need, you know, crores of rupees or hundreds of crores of rupees uh, and you are trying the scare tactics with your CEO to say, hey, if you don't do that, the data will not be secure. You are not doing your job. Um, your job is not to scare people into giving you money. Your job is to you know, improve the business outcomes of the company. So figure out a way to fix your cybersecurity, figure out a way to do it in an affordable manner and you know, then move on to use cases of AI. Okay. Um, now, when it comes to AI, this is what I will say, Jatinder. Um, I have a record um, while I was at uh, Procter & Gamble of creating uh, for the GBS, the Global Business Services or the Shared Services Industry, the equivalent of a Google X. Now, I'm sure you are familiar with Google X, which is the 10x, the 10 times improvement organization uh, at Google that has come out with the driverless cars and the balloon internet and stuff like that, right? So um, about eight years ago, I started to do this, except for the very boring areas of like accounting and payroll and IT and stuff like that. Uh, and I did that by creating an ecosystem, by inviting the Tartars, the IBMs, the Infosys, and so on and so forth, as well as the top 10 venture capitalists, the Andreessen's, the Sequoias, and then some of my own people at Procter & Gamble to come together into an ecosystem, right? The reason I'm sharing the story is because um, my goal was to create for the industry an ecosystem that would use technologies like AI and figure out use cases that were 10x, 10 times better than the status quo not 10%, okay? Um, and here's what I will share with you, um, Jatinder. Um, I was surprised there was no, literally no part of the operation of the company from HR, which by the way, ended up being one of the biggest potentially disruptive areas, right? Um, from accounts receivables and payables and finance and supply chain and you, know, you name it, legal, there is no part of the organization where we did not find a good AI use case. I will give you many examples. Um, so let's take HR. You know, I talked about um, HR being really disruptive. Um, this was the time before COVID. This was the time before Zoom was well known. Mm -hmm. Eight years ago, we found out that, hey, you know, there was this little startup called Zoom in Silicon Valley. Um, that had a product that was, you know, way, 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 way better than anything that existed at Microsoft and Cisco and so on and so forth. Um, and this was the opportunity to uh, make, 
you know, uh, uh, tap into um, video meetings the way that we used to do audio meetings 10 years ago, right? That was disruptive at that time. And of course, COVID in hindsight uh, was the trigger that made that, you know, evident to the rest of the world. I'll give you another really, you know, tactical HR example. Travel and expense report. So Jatinder, when you want to go from Gurgaon to San Francisco, you know, if you work in a big company, the big company will say, go to our travel agency. They will tell you where to book, what flights, they'll do the hotel and stuff like that. Um, well, you see, companies like Adobe and Google and many others don't do travel and expenses that way, right? So they say, go into our system, Jatinder, and you will get a budget. The budget will say for, you know, so many lakh rupees, you have to manage your trip. At that point in time, you can book wherever you want, you can stay wherever you want, you know, Airbnb, stay with some friends. If you have any expenses, charge it to the corporate card. And the corporate card takes all of that data and it uses that to manage spending. And by the way, AI then uses all of that information to see if there's any fraud. Um, AI also creates the expense report. So the hated creation of the expense report after the trip does not happen. But best of all for the company, if you allow people the freedom of knowing they can make their own decisions, they save the company anywhere from 15 to 35% of the travel budget. Companies like PNG used to spend at that time $400 million globally on travel and expenses. So, you know, 15 to 35% is a big deal. So, you know, literally pick your area, go work with startups and other systems. You will find any use case that you want. It will not be enterprise hardened. You then need to be very smart about how you build the ecosystem and, you know, you create reward systems for them to come back with an enterprise hardened solution for you. Yes. And so what I, the examples that I just gave, um, you know, they are about reimagining uh, mm. technology um, and processes. Um, so if you're a CIO today, you know, I'm not suggesting that you should not do RPA. I'm not suggesting that you should not invest in platforms of cybersecurity. Um, studies from Harvard and elsewhere uh, many years ago have proved that, you know, using some kind of a mix of people and budgets on day-to-day -day management, continuous improvement and disruptive innovation you know, you have to have three-part strategies, okay? Um, so CIOs that are so focused only on platform building um, that, and, and maybe some continuous improvement that they miss out on these big ideas, like the ones that I just shared with you, they are missing out on something. So the advice I would give people is, as you create your annual plan and your strategy, make sure that you've got maybe about 70% of your emphasis on the day-to-day, -day, maybe about 20% on the continuous improvement, but then also reimagine the future, you know, put some money, uh, some capacity, you know, some thinking into reimagining the future. So how do this business IT alignment, uh, that's, uh, in fact, I was uh, talking to one of the uh, CIO of a very large manufacturing firm. He shared this uh, concern and he said, this is what I'm facing. So how, how to solve those kind of challenges to bring CEOs and, you know, the, the top, top management on board with specific technology initiatives? Oh, you know, that's a really... Um... Uh, big challenge and a great question again, Jatinder. Um, so, you know, there is a difference between the, the traditional world and the fourth industrial revolution where, you know, when you're making, you know, a case for something to change, um, it is because you know that if you don't do it, then, you know, in 5, 10, 15, 20 years, your company is going to be at risk. Right, even if you don't see it now, right? Um, and so the job of the CIO has also evolved, right? You know, 30 years ago, um, as a CIO, uh, when I was the CIO of Procter & Gamble India, 
in uh, the uh, the uh, mid 90s um you know my job was much more easier it was about hey you know create a technology roadmap implement these technologies automate so on and so forth um within 20 years my job had changed to becoming more like the internal mckinsey to the ceo right which is a really important point cios have to understand that part of their modern CIO job is education, okay? Um, so, you know, CIOs that say, hey, my business partners are not tech, tech savvy, they are not educated. I would say, have you looked at your own role in educating them? Um, it is your job. Um, you are fortunate that you're living in an era where you know you may be the most important function for the future of the company. The fact that the CEOs, the finance leader, the, the supply chain leader don't understand it um, is not their problem. It is equally your problem because you have to find a way to educate them. You have to bring them along on the journey. Um, now, how do you do that? Well, how you don't do that is to preach to the CEO uh, or to say, hey, you know, these are all the possibilities. What's wrong with you? Why are you not doing that? The yeah, way you yeah. do that, the way you do that is by building your credibility through actual results. Uh, again, Wall Street financial metrics, growth of sales, growth of profitability or growth of assets. Start with small projects that are within your own control, that are cheap, that are quick to do. And then use that, you know, change some of your own skill sets to become more of an extrovert, to talk to them about, hey, you know, here's this amazing story. And oh, by the way, you know, I built this small little prototype. It did not cost me anything. Look at the value that it brings in on cash to the company and so on and so forth. If you iteratively do that, you build credibility and you educate people. And that's really important. Don't look for all orders to come top down. Um, we're living in a great world from an IT standpoint where actually, you know, it is our job to, to actually save the company sometimes. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, that's uh, extremely critical. And you rightly pointed out that uh, the skill sets, the skill sets, I mean, uh, uh, skill sets, they need to evolve and they need to come up with new skills. Having said that, uh, a lot of them are also facing uh, challenge to find appropriate talent in, uh, 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 you know, uh, whether it's in artificial intelligence or the new age cybersecurity experts. There's a massive crunch of finding right talent also who could, I mean, people who could actually manage all these processes efficiently. And specifically, since you talked about uh, some of the things in manufacturing domain, they are, uh, most of these CIOs are facing big challenge to replace uh, the existing workforce because a lot of them have, are not interested in some of the monotonous job that they have been doing. That's, that's another challenge that even with new technologies, they, uh, I mean, people are hard to find. I mean, with, 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 uh, who are capable to do things even with technologies. Um, you touch upon a really uh, important challenge, um, not just for the IT industry, but for the whole world, which is uh, upscaling. Um, it is a huge, 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 huge problem. Um, certainly in India uh, and the rest of the world as well, right? Um, um, at the same time, you know, that this is happening, you know, you have all of the expectation changes of Gen Z, uh, you know, which is that, you know, you cannot order me to do something. You cannot order me to come to work, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and at the same time, you have this massive evolution of AI and algorithms and, you know, new fields of science, and you just don't have qualified people available. Um, so, um, you know, I will say this, um, you know, this is probably the number one thing that, you know, keeps me awake, so to speak. Um, uh, when it comes to digital transformation. Um, it is how to uh, upskill people. It is how to develop talent at scale. Um, and, and, you know, 
I, I, I think there are some principles. There are no easy answers, by the way. So uh, sorry to disappoint those of your listeners that are hoping to get some easy answers. Um, there are none. Um, but there are two or three principles, I think, um, when it comes to this. Firstly, you know, what I would say is, you know, your HR strategy, your people strategy has to evolve to consider people to be much more of a long-term asset than a short-term skill set. So if you're hiring somebody, you know, just because they have a certain skill in algorithms, you may need to do that as a stopgap arrangement. But, you know, what I would counsel is, in addition to doing that, you know, find a way to get really smart raw material talent and develop them, give them capabilities, give them the opportunity to stay with your company for a very long time. You know, I will give you the example of a really small company called Clasis, which is based in Kochi. It's got about uh, a thousand people. Um, one of the things that their founder does is in addition to making the office very friendly, it's like, you want to work from home, that's perfectly fine. I will give you a, you know, a noise proof pod where you can work from home, right? Um, and, you know, it's like, if you stay with me more than five years, I will give you as part of your retirement um, capability, the ability to own your own house. So I will build houses for you to stay with, right? And, and you know, it's, it's no surprise that he gets some of the best talent around. So, so you have to change your, your HR strategy in addition, of course, to you know, plugging in the gaps that you have in the short term. No, that's uh, <clears throat> a very, very interesting and uh, very, very point, Tony. And uh, I think those insights, I'm sure those insights would be of great, great help to the uh, to our listeners and senior IT leaders who have who have been attending our session today. There are a few questions that uh, I would like to take up. Uh, questions uh, which have been shared by. Uh, some of the IT leaders, uh, <clears throat> attendees who have, who have been attending our session. Uh, could you share the uh, some of the strategies that organization can employ to break down internal siloed operations? Oh, that's, um, uh, that's the number one killer of most organizations, um, yeah. which is siloed operations, right? Um, this is this is the whole issue of end-to-end -end work process management. Um, so the reality is that you know most companies face this. In fact, I would say all companies face this because it is part of the evolution. Um, you know, if you're doing order to cash, then order taking is sales, order processing is you know sales, and then you know delivery pieces is supply chain, and then you've got finance right to collect the money, uh, and then IT across all of this. Um, so, you know, there are two or three principles. Firstly, you have to start to, you know, organize and give accountability for end-to-end -end work processes. What most people do is they design the processes to be end-to-end, -end, order to cash. But the accountability is still in siloed functions, you know, finance, sales, and so on and so forth. You have to change the accountability. Maybe you have to reorganize. Maybe you have to put together a global business services type of an organization structure, if that's what it takes, to bring all of those people together so that they can no longer optimize just within their silos. So that's the first thing, which is organize your accountability end to end. The second thing that you have to do is you have to start, in addition to the in-process siloed measures, you have to then you know, measure end to end, you know, it's like, what's your cost per unit of order to cash, right? Per order, not just, you know, what's your platform up time, you know, what's your uh, day sales outstanding and, you know, so on and so forth. So, so that's the second principle. The third principle is that what you then also have to do is then you have to give people a career path that can go across that end to end process. So just because you're an IT doesn't mean that you know, you cannot end up being in, you know, sales uh, because now you work for the end-to-end. -end. So those are some tips that I would offer. Thanks. Thanks, Tony. Uh, there's another gentleman who has uh, uh, asked another question that uh, is, there a, uh, <clears throat> is there a specific method or way for organization to uh, change their internal DNA at a rapid pace to become highly agile and customer-centric? 
Oh, that's another really big uh, question. Um, so what I would say is um, it is possible. It is much more possible than you think it is. Uh, changing customer DNA, uh, changing the organization's DNA will still always be very difficult, but you can do more than you think that you can. Um, so here's what, uh, here again are two or three tips that I would offer, right? Um, I think, first of all, it starts with the leader creating a vision for the organization on where are we headed and, and why do you need to change and how will you benefit from the change? So I'll give you an example um, within you know, my own experience. So when Procter & Gamble first created its GBS, Global Business Services Shared Services Organization, um, you know, uh, Procter & Gamble used to have, you know, the company annual employee satisfaction survey, like most other companies have. And the GBS organization was on a scale of 110 points below the company average. So if the company was, you know, in the 70s, GBS was in the 60s. Um, we went about changing the attitude of the people that were in this GBS organization. We said, here's the thing you are not just the back office of the back office. You are not cheap labor. Our vision is that you become the internal McKinsey or the Deloitte or the Accenture of the company. You will become so good at you know, technology and work processes and change management that you will become the transformation engine of the whole company. Uh, and then we went about hiring and developing skills and you know, reorganizing every two years so that you know people felt like they were working in like silicon valley not you know in a big company um and within three years uh three to four years um the annual satisfaction survey of gbs was about five points over the company average um so that's a pretty quick turnaround uh, in the employee belief. And then of course, we ended up creating the best in class model, which everybody else uses around GBS and shared services. So I think a lot of this goes back to, you know, the leadership and their vision of what they want to do in the organization and how they're going to reward people and train people and develop them and change the work processes. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Tony. Uh, Tony, there is another uh, one last question we would like to take. Uh, uh, there's a question that uh, uh, Mr. Mahesh has asked that uh, we are planning to implement Gen AI based use cases in our organization, but uh, but not sure where to start and what are the key things that we must avoid to make uh, our, our use cases a success? Um, uh, Mahesh, um, here are a few things I would say. Um, uh, start with what is the use case, not what is the technology uh, implementation. Um, so Gen AI is very, very broad. Um, in fact, you know, when I wrote my latest book, Revolutionizing Business Operations, um, which is all about changing the operations, you know, as I've been talking about, uh, you know, end-to-end -end process transformation and, you know, technology and stuff like that. One of the use cases um, I found was if you want to chat with my book, you know, there is a startup that literally within two hours digested my entire book, combined the information with what's available outside. And now you can actually chat with my book and ask me the book questions. So, you know, the first point there is um, don't get hung up with I need to implement Gen AI. You know, ask yourself, what is the very narrow use case? Right, and focus only on that use case first. Um, then you can expand use cases. The second, and that use case has got to be really high value. The second is what I would say is, you know, when it comes to Gen AI, start with existing proven use cases. So don't try and train the algorithms on your own because by the time you collect the data and you train the algorithms, it'll be three years and then, you know, by then the whole thing has gone, right? Um, so look at what other companies have done successfully, figure out a way to quickly and iteratively, you know, go get those use cases and implement them. And in these, case, these days you can do that very easily. The third thing I would say is 
be very careful of IT and technology companies who are trying to sell you platforms. You know, it's like, you know, buy my Microsoft OpenAI combined, you know, AI platform or buy what's the next, you know, whatever it is. All of those are good, but you are not in the platform business. You are in the use case business. So again, you know, initially focus on your use cases, get the thing done. And then later on, you know, when you have enough experience, you can back up a little bit and then ask yourself, how do I do this more efficiently? You know, what are the right platforms and things like that? Um, so those are some suggestions on how to get started. Well, thank you very much, Tony, for sharing your insights. Uh, we have run out of time and need to bring this session to a close. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you to all our audience for patiently uh, attending this session and sharing your valuable inputs and asking relevant questions. Uh, I'm sure everyone who has attended this session would have found uh, Tony's viewpoints very useful and helpful. Just in case if you have more questions, you can share with us. We will get them answered uh, from Tony. Uh, we'll uh, share it through uh, uh, email or probably provide you through WhatsApp. Whatever questions you have, please feel free to share them uh, with us. Thank you very much, Tony. Once again, it was lovely interacting with you. Uh, we look forward to having uh, more interesting conversations with you in 2024. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me.